This is one in the same cannon. The famous photo photograph that I know of at Fort Phoenix was with the troops standing here. And if you notice in that photograph, there is no magazine. Now, this is the magazine. The magazine was built and intended to hold 50,000 pounds of black powder. And that includes a uh, five-foot crust of concrete on the top, j just below the dirt line. The walls are granite, eight foot thick. There's a 13-foot, 15-foot, six-foot tunnel going into the main room. The main room has two feet of brick in an arched fashion, and the reason for the arched fashion, should there be an explosion within the magazine, it would not rip the, the, uh, the uh, overhead. It would, the pressure would roll, would roll around and come back down uh, to the base floor. And we're also standing here was two buildings of, of interest, starting at the corner of the block. And if you will look very closely, you'll see that the foundation is still below. At the base of the stone that we're looking at, that small square granite block, was the hearth fireplace. It's still intact there. Next to it are the stairs, the granite steps going down. And that's still intact. There's a wood cord chute halfway down the line if you follow the foundation. We were allowed to dig there back in 69, not being archaeologists. And, of course, any archaeologist who were with this saw would have frowned on the way we attacked the problem. But, you know, we were amateur. The town saw only good, and they allowed us to do it. And we only dug up half of it. We got bullets and other artifacts, a lot of bones were analyzed. We thought they might be human, but that uh, was not true. Now, that was a two-story garrison house. The first floor was the um, area where they fed the troops, and that's why the half fireplace is there. There was a great fire there in uh, August, August 11, 1872, and in that fire, the custodian, Sergeant Wetzel, who was maintaining the property for the government, got burned very badly. The local fire br brigade did not get here in time, and thus the house was lost. The second building that was here during, uh, as part of the uh, Civil War fort there was a two-story garrison house where the non-coms and the quartermaster were housed. It was almost connecting the magazine. And uh, that went down sometime after the turn of the century. Uh, you know, we can look around the fort and see different various plaques commemorating certain occasions. Of course, this is the, the British landing in 1778, uh, put there in 1930 by the Daughters of the American Revolution, Fort Phoenix chapter. There's also documentation on the large boulder standing uh, to the rear of us here. Uh, commemorating Daniel Eggery's role in saving the fort. That seems to be somewhat questionable in, in interpretation, and one may believe that uh, he didn't, in fact, to save the fort. He just came in to harass. There were hotheads in those days, but I'm not going to try to twist history. I'll let the reader decide for himself whether he was, in fact, trying to uh, uh, counterattack a large British force or just trying to harass. That stone was rolled up here. It used to be down in the valley. It was called the Rolling Stone. It was rolled and dragged up here by horses, and, and the, the, the uh, plaque was attached there as a commemorative uh, uh, event in 1905. It's strictly a Civil War magazine. We attached the door in 1969. We're given again. We're given permission by the town. Uh, we broke through the, the granite doorway. You can see the lintel on the top, the long granite lintel, and we could uh, discern the door from that. And we knew there was a door at one time there by some of the pictures that we had. There was also a vent hole up here, which is covered up by mortar. So we punched it open, and as I understand it, it was sealed in 1928. And sometime during World War II, uh, some of the vandals that came here punched a hole and got into the magazine, but the town quickly sealed it up. But they gave us permission. We had a door made, a steel door, so we can go in and out of the magazine. We do fire the guns, as you know now, and at certain occasions, uh, commemorating uh, you know some of the military history of the fort. So we have access uh, to the fort, and people, uh, local people and tourists, like to go in there from time to time. The only thing is it's so dark in there, you can hardly hold your own hand. <laughs> 1926, when finally it became available, the uh, federal government offered it a surplus, surplus property and offered it to the town of Fairhaven, who didn't have the $5,000 to purchase it. It was then offered to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and they really had no need for the fort. And then it went on to Bristol County, and they had no need nor the money to do it. And the town certainly could not afford it. So uh, Lady Fairhaven, uh, Lady Broughton, who was the daughter of Henry Hudson Rogers, whose mansion, if you look at some of the old photos, was right within view here. And if you see by the documentation on the Great Ledge uh, that his fa her father loved this spot. So in his name, she purchased it for $5,000 from the federal government. <clears throat> the papers were passed, and it was offered to the town as a permanent park. Now, there's a stipulation in the deed. Should this ever cease as a public park, it automatically and without charge reverts back to the federal government. So uh, keeping that in mind, so nothing can ever be built here uh, and because it's not a question of if 
it was solicited by the government, it automatically goes back to the government by virtue of, of the arrangement made in the deed. After uh, the, gov the government released the fort as an act of fort, the cannons, you know, the caretaker wets all over the winter. It's a very cold, isolated spot. In those days, didn't have modern heating equipment in the house in which they lived. So they probably, as the cannons rotted, they took the wood and burned it in the stove. And many of the old photographs show the guns, uh, the cannon uh, barrels lying on the ground. Well, there's someone came along from New York who had a big estate on the Hudson River and offered to purchase the cannons from the government, and it was the deal was going through. Well, this caused an outrage by the townspeople and said the cannons belong here as part of the character of the fort. It's part of Fair Haven. So the gentleman that purchased it and was going to bring it up on the, on the Hudson River said, look, I'll tell you what I'll do. If you house the cannons properly, I'll leave the guns here. So $325 was raised by virtue of clam bakes, by softball games, and whatever ways they solicited money. It doesn't sound like much now, but in those days, I guess it was a great sum of money, $325. And the carriages were built. And if you look at some of the old photos, and I'm talking the 20s and 30s and early 40s, the carriages are not of this character. This is the proper carriage, minus the wheels, uh, for these guns as we uh, we got the plans from the federal government from the archives so we know they're correct so it was just they were made out of north carolina white pine but they've gone through three or four sets of carriages the bobbit carriages they're called and uh one of our guys arthur fortier uh, over the last since then 75 made all of these by hand cut them drilled holes made the drills and uh, housed them again the, the wood was donated by um a Delano sawmill, it's native, solid oak, and a great weight to them. But, you know, we, we have a feeling for the fort, and this is why I like to do these things, the reenactments. They're, they're a lot of work, and uh, you really got to touch a lot of bases to pull something like this off. There's always a chance someone could get hurt. And third, for Haven's Fort Phoenix was the site of a Civil War battle reenactment and encampment. This event was sponsored by the Company B, 3rd Regiment Heavy Artillery, Massachusetts Volunteers, which is a Fairhaven-based Civil War troop, and the Fairhaven Historical Commission. These volunteer workers which you see are readying the fort for a weekend which will turn back the hands of the clock to July 1863, when the 1st Black Regiment in the Federal Army, the 54th Regiment, stormed Fort Wagner, South Carolina. Over 200 Confederate and Federal troops journeyed to the fort to dress, live, and do battle the way it was. Don Bernard, the encampment chairman, explains his reasons for staging such an event. And it all started quite by accident back in 1967 when my daughter came home from school uh, wanting to know if Fort Phoenix was a real fort. And I assumed it was because of the cannons in the facility, and I directed her to go to the Millicent Library, and that's why we have libraries, to uh, seek out this information. And when she went there, and this is no, uh, not being a shot at the library at all, as a matter of fact, I'm very close to the library. But she did find that there, there was no formal written documentation of Fort Phoenix other than a smattering and a number of publications. I couldn't just believe this to be a, it'd be a true fact. So uh, going down there myself, and, and sure enough, there was no formal uh, uh, book or, or, or information regarding a portfolio of any kind on Fort Phoenix. So I vowed right then and there that I would write a book on Fort Phoenix, which I did. And as I got involved in it, going to the so-called experts and going to Boston, research and getting the background material, I suddenly realized that why not take this and, and, and parlay it into something that people can share uh, and teach living history. So uh, we thought of doing the Lexington Concord bit right here in Fairhaven with Fort Phoenix, and the assault was the, was the thing to do. And after a year or so of getting prepared and starting the old Dartmouth militia, which we did, uh, I then realized in order to do the pageantry, you had to, to have uh, the red coats. And uh, reaching out and trying to get red coats, we were disappointed several times, and then it occurred to me that we ought to start our own company and, and, and do it. And that's exactly what we did. And it fi finally came to, to, uh, to its height in 1978 when we did the bicentennial, which was a super time. And therefore, we thought Bicentennial was being beaten to death, the revolution. We know that Fort Phoenix was a key part in the Civil War and protecting the harbor. And I thought that the area was ripe for Civil War activity. And to go long before the bathing beaches were here, Fort Phoenix had 50,000 tons of, of granite, such as the ledge that we see around here, uh, in its primitive time. And of course, Henry Hulson Rogers of Fairhaven removed it and built a, a lot of the town buildings, such as the Unitarian Church and some of the other uh, nice buildings in the area from this same ledge. Now we see a level parking area, but it, it did not have that appearance uh, back in the revolutionary days. This was a very favorite uh, spot, especially by the Indians, called Nolscott Point, N-O-L-S-C-O-T. 
And uh, the Indians came here in the summer from Middleborough that, where they wintered, and they would fish and get nice shell fishing from the harbor. Uh, it's a beautiful spot and uh, a very uh, geographic location and, and a natural for a fort to protect the inner harbor. Here's a tree here that uh, many people ask about this tree. This tree, uh, as far as the turn of the century, is the only tree left in the area. It's still standing. It doesn't seem to grow much. But if you get some of the earlier photos of the fort in this area, you'll see this lone tree is still here. Some, uh, some of the vandals a couple of weeks ago tried to burn it down. It would have been a shame uh, had they succeeded, but it went out. This was the site, if we look off the end of Skarniket Neck, the point of a little island called Black Rock, that was the site of the very first naval engagement of the Revolutionary War, despite the claims by Machaya Maine, who make the claim. But if you look at the documentation, you'll find that there's this June 15, um, 1775, while the Fairhaven incident, namely Skarniket Neck, is May 14th to 1775, which is really 30 days ahead, at least the school I attended. This, this fireplace, we call it the natural or the Indian fireplace, in many, many of the old uh, you know, photos, uh, stories that they relate to, the Indians used to cook their shellfish at, at Nolskut Point. And this is the, the natural uh, cookery, if you will, a primitive stove. You can see it's been burned many times before. They've cooked out of there. And it's still here, and it just adds a little more charm to the fort. The ledge, many people uh, chisel their names in the ledge, especially where the beacon was. As a matter of fact, I did that on it back in 76, and I don't know how long it'll last. Some of those names have been there for over 100 years. The breastworks, as we see, uh, have been uh, rebuilt a number of times, uh, especially during the Civil War when they uh, brought these big heavy seacoast cannons. They're called 24-pound seacoast cannons. There were two that are missing or rather three that are missing, and they're, they were given to Cambridgeport, Mass., which is Cambridge, Mass., today, and I think they may have gone to a scrap drive, but I'm not sure of that. There used to be a building which hung over, the rear of the building hung over where I'm standing right now, and the cistern was right there. Bill Dean, who was a former uh, custodian at the local schools and a police officer, who just died in the last few years, uh, was born in this house. His father built it in 1883, and it remained here at the fort until 1918 on November 11th on Armistice Day, when some enthusiastic uh, people burned it down in, in celebration. The breastworks have been changed so much since the Civil War. We had a little white picket fence. There was a picture taken from atop the ledge looking down, and the stone there the only reason for that stone sticking out is that it, it lashed the corner post of a large gate, and the sentry would guard the inner fort area. It had a white picket fence. The magazine was here, just beyond. The big seacoast cannons, they weigh three tons, the barrel. The carriage, solid oak, only minus the big wheels. And uh, they fire a 24-pound seacoast cannonball which could go as far away and catch the point of land. It would go over two miles using five pounds of black powder. There are other guns, if you examine, you'll find a smoothbore gun, which only had a shorter range of just a little less than two miles. Now, when Fort Tabor was built during the uh, Civil War, the thought was we should shut down Fort Phoenix because the, the new fort, the modern fort, could do a better job of protecting the harbor. But with those with, I guess, a little more smarts, proved that a ship could skirt the guns of Fort Tabor and go along the Fairhaven shoreline, thus getting by the, the, the big awesome guns of Fort Tabor. So it was proven that no way could they slip by into the harbor without getting by the guns of, of uh, Fort Phoenix. So they were both allowed to remain uh, active for the remainder of the war. The troops would go two weeks here and two weeks there and vice versa. And uh, this is how it served out the war. The, you see this lone gun that we have up here is uh, a gun that has a lot of character. It's the only one of the original ones. Now, that gun was cast in about uh, 1696. It's a six-pound naval cannon uh, cast in Great Britain. It was sent to Nassau on the Bahamas, or then called New Providence, and it was part of 100 cannons. And you'll see the documentation on the gun. Uh, if we can go up on top, I want to show you an inter interesting character of that gun. This is a naval carriage, normally found aboard ship. It's a six-pounder. If you'll notice the saddle or the new trunnions. And the reason for that, that's not uh, uh, in character with the gun in its original state. It had trunnions or the ears, as we see here, that were attached to the gun. 
But when the British captured the fort in 1778 and burned it, they, in those days, they used to spike a gun. Here's the vent. They would drive a spike and hammer it down. The gun was then useless. They would also knock the ears off so you could not elevate the gun. And if you look inside of the gun, you will find a hollow. Now, not to distract from the, the character of the gun, we built a self-supporting strap or harness uh, elevation uh, trunnion. But, uh, it, you know, that, and if you notice here also, you see the, the cipher, the king cipher, the lion head and the crown. And if you could turn the cannon upside down, you would see the weight of the gun, 1,807 pounds, which is on the bottom, stamped up number two. It fires a six-pound ball, and it was one that was captured by John Paul Jones in the Bahamas under Ezekiel Hopkins' fleet on February 1777. The fort was built uh, for protecting the inner harbor. They had no armament to arm the fort with, but uh, the militia people in the, in the town of Dartmouth in those days knew of several that were in need of repair in uh, Castle Island would they send them and the uh, government send them down and five of these tubes came from John Paul Jones's capture uh, 100 guns at Nassau and this is one of the five original and the only reason we have this one today is because that following the battle Nathaniel Pope of the first naval battle fame took this cannon if you look at many of the old photographs of Fairhaven the center of Fairhaven there's a cannon sticking out of the ground near the, near the Brown's drugstore which is the Phoenix Pharmacy today